Running Sentences presents Ghost Sounds Part 8 A Cursed Fight Things get ugly as everyone fights to survive, and for what is theirs? This story is written and narrated by Michael Henry. It is a work of fiction, so any names, characters, businesses, events, and situations within this story are products of the author's imagination. Any resemblance to real people, situations, characters, businesses, events, and or fictional businesses, characters, events, and so on is purely coincidental. Copyright 2024, Michael Henry. All rights reserved. Cha Franks and Agent Marx drive Zevian towards the cells in the back of the police station. An evil grin was on Marx's face as they came to a stop and shoved Zevian into one of the cell spaces. I don't know how this is going to help us out, Agent. Uh, this guy doesn't really seem to know anything. Relax, I'm with the government. We know ways of getting creatures like this to talk. And, uh, you know, it's a little unique of a situation. A uh, mumbo-jumbo supernatural crap that makes no sense to anyone. I don't think that's going to help. It's really not going to get any types of answers. Mark turned to Sheriff with that weird grin still present and looked the Sheriff up and down. You were a believer not that long ago? I, d I didn't believe, I just thought whatever was happening was fucked up. It, it doesn't make any sense. Kids disappear in plain sight and nobody can trace them. I mean, how does any of that work? It doesn't make any sense. You know, you have a scent on you. I, I have a what? The supernatural scent that marks you out for the rest of the world. Sheriff Franks took a few steps back, his hand going towards his gun in his holster. Have you gone crazy, sir? No, I know a problem when I see it and smell it. Further steps taken back by Franks, who drew his gun. On the other hand, in the cells, Evian had managed to recover a bit, and now got over to the cell bars to see what was going on. Shooting me won't solve it. You belong behind bars with this freak. A demon took over and made him steal children, and you humans couldn't even see what is going on. You, sir, need to shut up. You're ruining an investigation. You're talking madness. Ruining, really. You wouldn't believe that supernatural beings would come here and try to do what they're doing, and you're saying I'm ruining things? I have evidence and proof. I have no part of this. Can I go now? Franks, surprised by this sudden new voice, turned his gun on Zevian. His finger was already on the trigger, and in an instant, squeezed it. A bang echoed about the hallway, and the cells followed by a twang as the bullet hit something metal and went off somewhere. No, Zevian, you cannot leave. You're my answer for getting rid of the demons trying to come here. But first, you need to remember what happened. You're both fucked up, weirdos. You both belong in cells. Stop. Stop this. As Franks said this, he further backed up and on steady as he came with his hands shaking here and there as he tried to aim his gun. The trembling rocking his hand and his finger, which was still on the trigger, which made another bang follow, and to that made both Zebian and Mark turn away and duck. A bullet hit something again, but it wasn't either of them as the thunk hit somewhere in the back of the room. I'm leaving. You two are staying here in jail until I can figure out how to deal with you. At the door, he managed to get it open and stepped out, letting it close behind him. It sealed shut with a hiss that could barely be heard above the ringing in Zevian and Mark's ears. Then, as if nothing had happened, Mark stood up straight and turned his attention to Zevian. Finally, now we really can talk about what is going on. I can stretch my skills and my abilities to their limits. Won't that be fun? It does not sound fun at all. <laughs> For me it will be. You will howl in pain from all I inflict on you until I get what I want. Fun, fun, fun. In a move, the agent was by the stall door, 
pulling it open with that evil grin that never left his face. I, I told you, I don't know anything. A lie once told cannot be undone, Zevian. You have those memories, and they're hidden deep in there, but they are there. Is, th is there a non-violent way of reaching them? I would go for that before whatever it is you're doing. Zevian tried to move to the corner of the cell, backing away from Mark. He shrank into the corner, going down to a sitting position as the agent approached, fist raised. Well, perhaps there is. I don't know it, and I don't care to find out about it. And with that, the fist began to fall onto Zevian's face. The birds had grabbed a book, pulling him in two directions, which pulled at him, but didn't pull him apart. Instead, their talons ripped into his body, gashing at it with their horrible scratches, before letting go and then grabbing again. Pulled this way and that, Book tried to stay upright, but lost his balance, sliding and then tumbling down a dune, a salty sand, which then packed into the fresh wounds, and then falling out of his wounds as it went. It came to a crashing stop at the bottom, as the old hag of a demon staring over at him as he stopped at her feet. You have no choice but to help me. I've been getting that a lot lately. I don't think it is true. You need to get Malthouse out of the tunnels for a while, and I can help you with your mission. That is all I'm asking, really. Book was slow to get up, trying to brush the sands off of himself and not notice the nice tingle of pain that was shooting through his wounds. His head was swimming since he'd been sent here, here and there, with no directions, and then when they did come, more often they sent him backwards. It was all very confusing. Why do you want him out? I believe the mine is tainted and obscuring him from his goals. He needs a new one, but he cannot see it. He's almost through to the other side. Oh, please. Every demon says that for centuries and a millennium that they've tried. There's no luck other than they eventually get sick and die in those places. We can't die. Not that you know of. Everything dies eventually. It is a matter of time under this sun or on the next plane of existence. Demons can be reborn, but... Uh... They're new and only have vague memories of what they're doing, and then, well, they start mining again. Book looked around to see where the birds were and if he could run again. They weren't far off from him, so he chose not to at the moment. You want to save Malthouse. That's what this is all about? Well, yes, but, um, whatever is driving him to this search isn't me. I'm just trying to help out. So it was not you interfering with me or Malthus in his goal. She nodded yes. You need to go back now and talk to him. He won't listen to me. Then find a way to make him listen and get him out of there. We do that, and we might be able to stop something worse from happening. But who knows? What's worse? You don't want to know that right now. But let's say another being, aside from humans, hates us and can drive us mad. Book took a few steps back, realizing he was being allowed to go. Should he help? If he nodded yes, he could figure out what she was talking about. Those dratted, wigged creatures who got their way and beamed of light. They were sometimes worse than demons with what they did and pulled off. Namely against humans, but uh, his only question was to help or strive for freedom. If only he had a firm answer. But he nodded yes and began to depart. The bullets stopped firing after a minute of non-stop noise. Bart had plugged his ears as best he could, but they were still heavily ringing. He was also struggling with the blinking lights, since he'd seen so many flashing lights and could barely make out the shapes that were now approaching him. Get on your knees, scum. This is the police. A gun was directed towards his face, and instinctively, Bart grabbed it to wrestle it away. A jostle went on for a moment before another of the gunmen came up to try and stop him. 
He saw them, though, and with a free hand, slapped at the figure, sending them to the ground. A throb of pain and anguish knocked into his head, as well as a voice he hadn't heard from in a long time. Welcome back. I think it's time you let me have some fun with these humans. Don't you agree? I don't think that's a good idea, Jester. Oh, it is always a good idea to let me come out and play. You've already tapped into my power and don't think I will come to play? You. I said get down, scum. This was an officer in a safety vest and holding out an overly large pistol that was then pulled back. It whipped forward, but first towards Bart's head. Down, damn you. Having realized that the pistol was no longer in his grip, on instinct, Bart raised his arm, using his forearm as a shield against the blow. Not to stop the pistol, but stopping the arm from fully swinging and meeting his enemy's forearm with his own and stopping the action neatly. Surprised, the officer backed away for a few steps and leveled the gun at Bart. You are under arrest. On what charges? Yes, what charges? The officer's mouth dropped open upon hearing two very different voices coming out of Bart. You're a madman. No, I'm not, and I don't think that's a charge. What he had failed to notice was that he was being surrounded by these folks who all had their guns drawn towards him, but it only took a moment for him to, to realize what was going on, and Bart shook his head. If you shoot me, bad things will happen. Follow our orders, then. You'd have to give me time to do so, and you don't actually want me to. You've already been shooting at a car, and probably hitting my friend inside, and for what? You broke the law! Again, what law? There was a silence as lots of fingers went towards triggers on their weapons. All it would take is for one to decide that they'd had enough, and he was sure that there was at least one among them. There was an itch in the air that was followed by the repeated bangs of several guns going off once again. And so he evaporated into dust. Where did he go? It doesn't matter. Grab the one in the car and let's get out of here. Spooky, supernatural shit that we don't get paid enough to deal with. The fragments of dust blew to the side, gathered, and washed a fence on fold. Laura was yanked out of the car with three or four bullet wounds in, in her chest area, and then simply dragged away to another car, which took off once she was inside. The dust then blew away, following after them. A pile of sand gathered around the entrance to which Ralph found himself stuck in. It was a massive cave before him, but one filled with spiderwebs and other creatures that lurked in the darkness. His eyes adjusted to the fact that there was no light to be seen as he struggled to get out of the sand and figure out where he was. His legs soon plopped free of the sand, sending bits of red sand spewing this way and that. To him, that told him he was at least somewhere near home, since the air felt similar and close to it. Hello! He called out, not expecting an answer, as he clambered down from the pile of sand he was on. His feet soon touched on the harsh stone that felt jagged to walk on. While waiting for a response, he looked around again, but gave up in short order, since there was a loud humming noise coming from in front of him. Is someone there? There was a strobe of light that cut through the darkness, sending all sorts of creatures scurrying for the shadows in this cave. The light was followed by a robed figure who was humming loudly as it approached, and then stopped all movement and noise. Who are you? Some call me Judas, others high being and ruler of the plane of existence. Are you one of the... No, not one of them, not an angel, and I can tell you are a demon who has lost his way. I didn't lose my way, I got sucked into a portal since I was on a different plane of existence. So you did lose your way since you're in temporal form. You may not believe it to be, but uh, it happens to many demons and even angels and the odd occasional human. 
What do you mean? They wind up here as a result of losing connection with their realm? Yes, all eventually wind up here. What, is this purgatory? No, that would be boring. This is a place for the misfits until they find some way of moving on. Show me the fastest way to the exit, then. The hooded figure pulled at the hood to reveal a face. Cracked, worn, and deep lines that divided things into sections. The hollow-looking blue eyes stared towards Ralph. If I knew that, I would not be here myself. You know of creatures escaping, though. I know of stories and the fact that some have gone out and never returned. A shiver ran around Ralph's ether body, which was disappointing when he realized he was not whole still. His bottom half, his legs, were there, but the rest of him seemed not to have taken any form other than a ghostly wisps of smoke. He looked to this robed figure who called himself Judas, who seemed all solid, but uh, it was hard to tell fully with that robe surrounding them. Are you like me? How do you mean? Visually, are you speaking like a half-shaped creature, or do you mean differently? I already told you that we are all alike here, yeah? as lost creatures, if that's what you mean. I mean like I look half solid and the other half of this form. Most that come here are like that, yes. It all varies to degrees and form of how cursed they were when they lost themselves. Having had enough of this, Book began moving towards this Judas with the intent of getting out of the cave. He wanted some fresh air and to see some sunlight. You might want to be careful. Why? These caverns are dark, and unless you can see in the dark, charging around like that is likely to make you walk off a ledge. This place is a cave. The entire place. No sunlight or anything like that. No fresh air. So it is one giant cave system to explore as far as I can see and get lost in. Most creatures I come across only I only see once or twice when they come here and, uh, if I come across them exploring the mines. Ralph, not wanting to hear any more of this, ran forward, grabbing at the lantern that Judas had, and went for the exit. His hands went right through the light, but he didn't stop to think or worry about that, since he was moving, and he needed to get out of there. Luckily, his legs dodged around Judas without much trouble. The sounds of sirens and yells were foggily heard by Laura, it was close yet distant, and she tried to concentrate over the numbing feeling that she had. There was also the sensation of being moved, jerked about really, as she could see some blue sky, but then disappeared to a white thing. What did you do? She got in the way of a chase of a weird criminal. He got away, she got shot in the car. You really should learn not to shoot things up. Shut up. We were under strict order to shoot all things that managed to get where they weren't supposed to be. What kind of orders are those? Ones you don't want to get mixed up in, ENT. Get her to the hospital and keep her under watch, will you? I have bosses who want to ask questions. Well, that's what we planned on doing. And make sure she survives. We do have questions for her. The back of what Laura assumed was an ambulance slammed shut and she blinked as the two workers looked her over. Can you hear us? Shake your head if you can. Jeez, is she still alive? Twelve shots? Something like that? Maybe six, maybe three, who knows? So much blood and still alive. She tried to move about, but all that came was pain. Ah, uh, she looks like she can see us from judging from the way her eyes are moving. We have to stabilize it, though, so no further gasps of surprise. It's going to be hard to contain them. I know, but do your fucking work, will you? Don't be surprised by anything that happens to her. The two set about working as best they could, keeping her exactly alive. Book had taken his time to get back to the cavern entrance that Malthus was using for his plans. He didn't particularly want to go in there to talk to the angry demon who wouldn't listen to him. 
and one who would probably try to rip him apart for even suggesting doing anything. What to do? I can't go against anyone here, since I'm not strong enough, and the only weaker one, Ralph, isn't around. Where did he go off to? He would be a useful tool. A rumble from inside the tunnel sent dozens of children, some of whom had been here for at least fifty years, scurrying away. A puff of sand came billowing out after them, which could only mean that one of the shafts had collapsed. One more bad thing to report on. He slowly began moving towards the mine opening, which now had a thick glare of yellow-red sand coating the floor of the area. The trek into the deep, dark bowels of the cave, and then to find Malfess's spot, wasn't fun. The sand kept getting deeper until it was at his knees, making walking a difficult task to do, since the sand always sunk when he stepped on it. Entering into the cave of Malfast, the place was not the usual state of darkness, but rather well lit this time. He could see the large, deep space, but none of the creature he had come to see. It gave him a moment to breathe a sigh of relief, as his thoughts were all over the place. You returned! Ah, uh, yes, news to report on some things, sir. I'm sure you felt the recent shudder in the cave. Apparently one of the shafts has fallen. I don't know which one, since I have just returned. I don't care about that. Right, you care about who is after you. Yes! Ralph took a tentative step forward, with a deep breath to make sure he had what he wanted to say on the top of his mind. It appears, according to some sources, that your mind is poisoned or so it is claimed by the former lover of yours. She believes that some other former lover or workers wants you dead. Uh, this was a Rosa, I believe, by the way. I only care about who is disturbing my operation. And by only caring about that, you may die in the mine because of it. I don't care as long as I get close to getting through. We are so... Close. How many years have you said that? I've worked here for too long, and that's all I would ever hear from you. We're close, but the work in the tunnels has always fallen short and never showed that we were close. You're poisoning yourself by being in here and thinking that close is an option. A slug of Malfast scurried around and came so that he was now closer to both. An angry and hurt look painted across his face that now towered up in the air and away from him. And all you have ever provided was excuses. You say this place is making me sick, but I feel fine, better than fine. And our workers, those children, have never shown any ill signs. A glance backward towards the mine and trying to buy himself a moment to think, Book wondered about that. He wasn't so sure that the children weren't getting sick. After all, they had to keep getting new ones. I'm offering you a way out. If you don't want to get out of the mine for a little while, that's your choice. But I'm free. I've found a source of information that would point you in the right direction. If you don't take it, well, that's on you. Having made it a few steps, everything suddenly twisted from view in a swirl of things that plunged Book's world into light. The sense that he was traveling quickly to some location bothered him, since he had no idea where he was going. Laura was rushed by the doctors into the emergency room operating table. They were trying to patch up and help transfuse blood back into her. It was a long, grueling several hours before they felt comfortable moving her out of that room. The entire time, she felt like she was floating above her body, watching all that was going on. It made her sick, and she looked away towards the observation room nearby. There were familiar-looking faces that had put her in the hospital, but behind them caught her attention as well. It was a group of dirt that seemed to settle into a corner, unnoticed, and a weird, warm sensation came over when she looked at it. I see you have some abilities of your own. Swinging about, Laura tried to find where Bart's voice had come from, then settled looking on the observation room again. 
yeah, I'm uh, dusty dirt right now. In order to save myself, I can turn into that. It's not really super helpful, but uh, most people don't like dust, so they let it go. Anyway, it also represents the depraved side of me, so if you don't mind looking away for a few moments... Why? What are you doing? A bit of work taking care of fools who put you here without a thought as to who they are tangling up in their affairs. You were innocent. I was on the same case as you were. How does that make me innocent? That doesn't mean they can shoot you, though. The dirt and dust in the observation room began kicking up heavily, and the window soon became obscured as it whipped around from what had looked to be a small pile into something that blocked the entire thing. Laura pushed and floated her way over, trying to see if she could pass through the walls into the room. However, the closer she got to it, the more it felt like something was pushing her back towards her body, and then found herself being pulled heavily back towards her body. She is stable and will probably make it. In a rush of things for her, it felt like all things were being sucked backwards in a swirl and blur of things taking over. Then it was all black. The dirty window had made the two observers, Bored and Martin, take steps back. They were shaking their heads as Bart materialized behind them with a grimace and actually nude. You two! They swung around as Bart threw his fist the one to the right, who happened to be bored. A glass-like chin sent the man sprawling to the floor unconscious. Whoa, how did, how did you get here? It really is supernatural shit the feds were talking about. Martin tried to take a step to head for the door, but Bart grabbed a hold of his arm. You have some explaining to do about why you'd shoot up a car and why the feds are interested. I I don't really know anything. I would have believed you had you not opened your mouth and said something, but you did, so if you would be so kind as to explain... No, no thanks. Bart pulled the man's arm hard, and since he was trying to get away, it almost pulled it out of the socket. This stopped when the pain began too much for Martin, who had taken a few short steps away and then was now moving back towards Bart. I can pull you apart if I wish, or you wish. I do have powers, and now that you've awoken my other side, it wants to have fun, so it will pull you apart. No, I I, I can't tell you anything. You can, and if you want to be alive by the end of this, you will. The choice is a simple one for one who values keeping things the way they were. Bard applied a little more pressure by pulling downwards and took a step closer. I either pull this out of the socket or you give in. Which happens first? Ow! Give in and give me some information. There was a squirm from this person who was trying to get to an angle that would make their arm not hurt so much. There's a weird agency that's been ordering us to do stuff. We never heard of them, but uh, they keep showing us badges, and and the police say go along with them. Are you a police officer? Former. Retired. I work when they need help looking for things. Bart looked at the semi-young-looking former officer. If he was telling the truth, which might be plausible since there was a variety of reasons one might retire early, it made things interesting. Trust, though, was not high on his priorities and there was the case of what they were doing around demon business. You mean the children? Yes, how did you know? Nothing has been publicly announced. I've been working a case to find out why the original disappearances happened, since you lot cannot figure out shit. Or maybe you did and your agency swept it under the rug. I don't know anything about that. Ow! Bart put more pressure on the arm to keep things hard. What exactly is the agency? I don't remember the name, but uh, they said they were part of a federal agency of cops. Fucking hell, the supernatural fuckers are now legit in the government. Jesus Christ. I, I don't know about legit. They keep saying we have to keep things quiet and not mention them. With one last heavy twist, the figure went limp in Bart's hands. And then Bart dropped the arm, which flopped over and onto the man, who was still semi-conscious, but barely holding on as he grabbed at his arm. 
Do you have a name, the agent in charge, I mean, or their associates? No, I, I, I don't remember. And it is all just rumors, nothing said out loud. That is unfortunate, since it means I can't trust you. You tell me a bunch of shit, and then, then it's all gossip. What am I supposed to do with you? The man who had been crumpled onto the floor holding his arm was now kicking at the ground to help get himself away a few inches. It... He then managed a few feet of separation, which Bart was ignoring, having turned his attention to the one he knocked out with a punch, still splayed to the ground. The sound of the door opening and closing didn't even bother Bart as he began stripping the clothes off of the unconscious one, but not before going through his wallet to find the name Carter Board, security officer. Well, Mr. Board, it is an unfortunate situation for you, but I need your clothes if I'm to be around here to keep an eye on things. Best of luck when you wake up, though. He was soon dressing himself, which were a bit maggy on him. Not wasting any time, though, Bart was quick to leave the little observation room. The truth to what he had been told, Ralph found himself plunged into never-ending darkness. He could hear the drip drip nearby water as he made his way forward. His pace, which had been a run, had turned into a crawl of a slow, tentative step. There had already been one step where his foot meant nothing, and he had pitched forward since he had been running. His face went through the stone, but his legs thankfully had kept him on the side of safety. Do be careful. Running around here gets you nowhere other than down. I don't know what is down there, but you can occasionally still hear the screams of those who went over the edge. Ralph dusted himself off after that little episode and kept moving forward. The light that the Judas had held was now not strong enough to pierce through this darkness. Is this some kind of hell? No, no. Well, I can't say that for certain, and surely it might be. But it isn't good, and it isn't bad, and it isn't mediocre, so it is something. What is it, then? As I said, a place for lost souls to find themselves. I told you about it already, but you don't seem to want to listen to me. You have to take it slowly, otherwise you will be stuck here, and I don't want to hear your incessant moaning and screaming of having gone off the edge. You're already annoying as it is. How can you call me annoying? Well, you don't listen to what's being told to you and then screech that things are all wrong. Now, do you want out of here? Yes, of course I want that. Then move carefully and think about how you move. The remaining light flickered out, and this Judas seemed to have vanished. Couldn't hear any breathing or sounds coming from the figure who had been behind him by more than a few steps. Are you still there? There was more than a few moments of idly waiting for a response. He got the sound of steady, dripping water, but nothing else to help him out. With a sinking stomach, he slowly turned and began moving forward, foot by foot. He felt the instinct to reach out and grasp at the wall, since his hands would go right through it, he had to remind himself of. A steady step kept him moving. <sighs> the scream from below was faint but audible to Ralph, who felt it shake him in his body something deathly about it, and the cursed idea of falling forever. A bedroom light came into sight for Book, who realized that he was wrong an instant later. This was a hospital bedroom, with the patient lying on a bed, heavily incubated. They were female of some sort, and he wondered if the body had been intended for him to drop into. If that was the case, Malfas was losing his touch and senses to this world, which meant the sickness might actually be very real. Well, let's at least see who you are, miss. His ethereal form moved over to where the charts were hanging. Picking them up wouldn't be possible unless he drew a lot of strength and energy, and he didn't want to waste time trying to do that. Instead, he knelt down to be face level with it. Ah, Laura Broomstone, how nice. 
The sound of the door opening behind him made Book turn and look. In had strolled a rather decent-looking man in poor-looking clothing. Security clothing didn't seem to fit. The figure stopped in the doorway. A shade of a ghost or a demon. You can see me? Easily, yes. Who are you? A demon or an angel sent to destroy the last bastion of niceness between the world. Answer me and do it quickly. What I am and who I am is none of your business. I need to know how you can see me, though. Answer me that and we might have a chat. This figure moved into the room, their fists flexing, to which Book bit back a laugh. This idiot really was an idiot. He was going to hit a ghostly, ethereal shape. Name is Bartholomew, and I'm sure you can figure out how I can see you so easily. No, I cannot. I haven't ever had the pleasure of running across your idiotic type. Are you an angel or one of those lucky to escape from some place that is? Some other realm, perhaps? I'm an escapee who has a contract. Sniffing at the air, there was a faint, familiar scent to a book, who got the feeling this one had at least, at some point, been in the demonic realm. Well, you are interrupting me in the middle of something. No, I'm not, because you're not going to take over that body. Well, it was planned for me. He jumped for the body as Bart jumped for him. End of Part 8 of Ghost Sands Thank you for listening.